So I think participants will keep on joining. We are recording this session and we will be uploading this lecture on our YouTube, uh, YouTube channel, on our Facebook page, on our Twitter and Instagram. So I think you, you should start uh, delivering the lecture. And uh, okay. thank you very much for uh, joining it. So, okay, sure. Yeah, just give me a minute. So I'm just gonna share the screen and just let me know if you all can see that. Um, so uh, can you give me the access to the to share the screen, please? Sure, sir. Um, sorry for that. Now, now you can share the screen. So can you all share, see my screen? Yes, sir, we can We can see. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. So is it okay if I can keep my video off or do you want me to on it? <laughs> Just a question. Um, sir, oh, whichever way you're comfortable with. <laughs> okay, sure, okay. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, Thank you so much for joining this session and thank you to this uh, Earthly Environmental Perspective magazine and Rabia to arrange this session. Uh, basically what I'm talking today is all about water and I'm hope, I'm believing that most of us are environmental engineers and some somewhat who are related to the water background. So basically, <laughs> if I'm going to brief uh, about the today's topic and the research, everything is revolved around the uh, freshwater system challenges, you know, what we are facing today, how the world is revolving around water and how, you know, we are trying to go towards the digital water quality monitoring. But most important thing is to understand what is the challenge and how we can communicate uh, this particular aspect to the wider community, because not everyone is an expert in water. Not everyone understand you know, these parameters, or like how, you know, we define the quality, how we define the pollution. So it's very, very important, not only to treat the water, but also to communicate the, what this issue is all about. So moving forward, uh, today my invited talk is all about the research that I did a few months back, uh, which is the main topic, which is uh, drinking water quality assessment and distribution of networks. And it's a water footprint approach. Uh, I'm Harish Inya. I'm currently working in uh, UBC Okanagan, and previously I was a part of UB, uh, UET. I'm still a faculty member there, but I'm just here for a certain time. Moving forward, uh, this is the content which I'll be presenting today, and I'm going to be presenting a pretty brief background of all of this. I mean, we will have, I'll try to have more interactive session, but we'll see how the my presentation goes on. So it's all about the background motivation, some assessment approaches, uh, you know, the common approaches are indexing a footprint. And I'm gonna discuss some key results and finding and the originality of this kind of research. Uh, okay, so moving forward, uh, when we try to map the background, I mean, it's very, very important to see what the exact issue is, you know, we always try to portray there's an issue with the fresh water quality, there's a water pollution, but we don't actually you know, quantify it. 
But if you look into today's global statistics, there's a big problem of water scarcity, and which is pretty much affecting more than 40% of the global population. And most of our systems, when we define a water distribution system, you know, a municipality or a, you know, or a city who's managing the water, you know, most of the, in most of the areas, there's a problem with the water quality failure. Now, what water quality failure is, water quality failure is basically how we define is, you know, a certain parameter is not meeting the guideline or there's a contamination in the drinking water or a drinking water is causing a human health problem. So when we try to map all of these challenges, and particularly when we look into the water scarcity, which is a global issue, when we talk about water quality, it is also becoming a global issue. And we try to link with the overall, what are the pressures or what are, what, what are the reasons of these you know, increasing water scarcity and quality challenges? Once, first is, as you can see, is the population growth. Then comes the you know, water quality as it, itself as a challenge. You know, infrastructure performance, financial and technical constraints. So these are all the issues uh, basically, which is causing these, these type of water scarcity or water quality that we should be looking into in a more broader perspective rather than just thinking that we need to do the treatment. Treatment of drinking water is just one thing. And just to, um, why I'm emphasizing is because most of you, I mean, are from the background, which you know, you're gonna be building up the career and we you know, try to see if we are to clean the water, we always say, okay, we have to treat the water. And uh, no, I know that's a very important respect. But remember this thing, treatment or any type of you know, uh, thing that we can apply, it's gonna apply once. The most important is the management. Once you dwell something, you, know, you need to manage it. And the management you know, takes long-term. You, know, you need to manage a treatment plan for 10 years or maybe 20 years or 25 years. It, you, 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 know, you construct a treatment plan for just one time and you can manage it for maybe for a lifetime. So this is basically a concept. And when we try to map it into a very famous uh, framework, and if you Google it, PSR framework, like pressure state response. So this is kind of a, a framework that can actually maps all of the challenges into different you know, subunits, which is what are the pressures? Like I already discussed the pressures like population growth, water quality, financial and technical constraints, and similarly, what those pressures are impacting on is the state, like it is affecting you know natural water sources, water quality, climate change, which is kind of a big issue these days. And what are the response? How as an individual or as an engineer or as a profession, how we can respond it? So we can look for to identify it, you know, predict the you know change, monitor it, assess it, and manage it. So you know we have to map a problem into a different, you know, into a framework in which we can quantify it. You know, what is the problem, where it is affecting, and how we're gonna respond it. Okay, moving forward, I mean, water distribution networks, I'm sure most of you know, water distribution networks are designed to supply water to the community. And we, we basically usually study that. But the main goal of water distribution network is to provide sufficient water quantity and pressure. And the second one is the quality. So these are the two main goals. And whole our discussion, which I'm trying to you know, direct is towards the quality, like how important the water quality is. And not only to see the quality, but to manage it. So building up this whole background, uh, the motivation, which I kind of presumed and I believe, this is a, you know, a step that we always, as environmental engineer or professional do that, we do sampling and monitoring. We assess and evaluate, and then we control and manage. Uh, basically, when we look into this, first part, most of us, most of the people you really look for, sampling and monitoring. They see, you know, you do, you do the sampling, you do the monitoring. And moving forward, uh, can I think there's a background noise. If anyone, everyone can mute that, please. Everyone, uh, please mute. Uh, I think it's all good, yeah, thank you. Okay, so now, these are the three main steps uh, uh, we always try to look into. And when we go from sampling and monitoring to control and manage, the, the most, most important step is to assess and evaluate, and that's most of the people miss. 
why they miss because mostly we are of the belief that okay if we have a data you know we measure let's say 16 water quality parameters and you have the values you know those parameters you and even a person who is in your area know understand this but when you have to communicate those parameters to a wide community who are not expert in the water background how are you going to convince that this is a problem that's where you know assess and evaluate comes in and that's where most of the management techniques comes in you know you need to like what how we do we should be thinking is try to communicate those impacts to the people who doesn't have those type of backgrounds and for those these there are some water quality you know assessment approaches i mean you can see on the slide i mean there are two types of basically assessment approaches one is the indexing page and other is the footprint base the on the left side the indexing base approach these are very common I mean, they have been applied globally in different you know, aspects, which includes you know, chemical water quality index, overall index of pollution, water quality index for fresh water, scatter score, Canadian water quality index, contamination index. So basically indexing is just to you know, give the numbers based on the pollution and try to simplify the overall you know, situation of the water pollution. Similarly, on the right side, you know, in the last 10 years, due to global, you know, more involvement towards the global footprint concept, a lot of uh, new approaches developing, which includes you know, biodiversity footprint, phosphorus footprint, land footprint, water footprint, ozone footprint. These concepts were before that, but now why they are becoming important? Because these concepts are you know, helping most of the professionals to communicate the footprint or the impact in their specific area to the wider community. And it is very important that we understand those concepts. So my whole, this presentation will be more focusing towards the Canadian water quality index and the water footprint approach, which I use in the research. And that's not the, that's not the ultimate goal. We can adopt any approach, any methodology, anything that we like. But the idea is we need to, we need to think that how we can communicate to the much wider uh, community who are not you know, experts in these areas. So let's move forward. Uh, first, I will be discussing Canadian Water Quality Index approach. I mean, this is the approach I applied in my research, but this is a, this is this approach has been developed twenty years back, and it's very commonly applied. Basically, that's a, that approach is just you know you measure something, uh, you know you measure fifteen or sixteen water quality parameter of four or five, you know it's up to you how much data you have. And we try to combine all the parameters and present them into scores that's between zero and hundred, as you can see, I mentioned on the slide. And it is calculated based on three main factors, uh, as mentioned, one is the scope, uh, second one is the frequency, and third one is the amplitude. And on the right bottom is just a formula that how you know you calculate this F1, F2, F3. F1 is scope, F2 is frequency, and F3 is amplitude. Now, this is not like, it's, it's the only way to calculate the water quality, but the main aspect, is to communicate. So this, if you have you know 20 or 25 parameters, how are you going to present those parameters? How are you going to see whether my treatment plant or my municipality is working perfectly? You know, by applying this approach, you can actually you know simplify the data and and you know define the whole water quality based on based on the score between zero and hundred. So a higher score reflects the better water quality. And you know, with this approach, obviously there are some limitations that it depends on the data, expert judgment, and threshold. But overall, that's the main goal. We have to communicate that. So just going a bit deeper, how are we gonna, how are we gonna use this uh, technique? As you can see, F1, uh, I'll start you know, putting something on the screen. Okay, where is that? Okay, so yeah, so F1. So, okay, just give me a second, please. Okay, where is that? Yeah, it's working, I think. Clear our drawings. Sorry, guys. Mm. Okay, yeah. So F1 is a scope. What it represents is, you know, it quantifies, you know, the percentage of the parameters. Parameters means water quality parameters that doesn't meet the guidelines. So basically, guideline can be for any in a country or any place. And it's very flexible. So you identify how many number of parameters failed in the total number of parameters considered. That's scope. You know, what is the broader scope? When we look for the F2, 
it represents the frequency. How many times a particular you know, testing does fail? Similarly, F3 is the amplitude which defines how much is the how how to how much factor it has, you know, it doesn't meet the guideline. So these are the formulas. I mean, I'm not gonna go into the details, but I'll try to give, I'll try to put, I have put some example to explain how we're gonna calculate it. So if I move to the next slide, just to, so this is example, I mean, just to give you guys a heads up. So this is, you know, a typical water quality testing report. We have, we have, let's say DO, TH, you know, total phosphorus, total nitrogen, you know, fecal coliform, arsenic, you know, lead, and all those. So we have those, you know, you know, data that is recorded, sampling and monitoring. And we have the guideline on the bottom. At the bottom, you can see that. So how are we going to calculate the index of this? Like there are, you know, 10 parameters, and all of them are, have been reported in different ways. So as an environmental engineer, you will understand, okay, these are the parameters. Some are meeting the guidelines, some are not. But if you have to present this whole thing to someone who is from a management background or who is some from a different background, how are you going to do it? Right, one approach is you're going to do the average. Second approach is you're going to you know, put some discussion. So this indexing approach simplifies the whole concept. So you can actually quantify the whole, you know, whole idea into one number, and that can be presented as high, medium, and low, or any number. So if you look at F1 on the bottom, it's written uh, two out of 10 into 100, and which is 20. So how two out of 10? So if you can notice on the table, uh, I again try to write something. Let's see if, if that works this time. So you can see here. Can you see the screen? I put yes, something. Yes, yeah. yeah, so this is 0 0.058. I mean, you can see it's higher than this guideline, 0 0.05. So that's one. So that means in total phosphorus, there is some, you know, exceedance between from the guideline. And similarly, if you notice here, this value was higher. There are other values as well. So basically out of two parameters, like total phosphorus and this one, out of 10 parameters, two failed the test. So F1 will be 20. In the second one, you know, you have in these all these numbers that in total, they become one of three. So in total, this one, this one, this one, and this one, these four doesn't meet the guideline. The rest of them are okay, but these four doesn't meet the guideline. So these were four. So four out of 103 here, that makes F2 as you know, uh, 3.9. So that's how you calculate the, or you try to map or communicate into simple way. Moving forward as a F3 in the next slide, uh, just a second, please. Yeah, this one. This is how we calculate uh, the amplitude, which is extrusion. And I'm gonna just simplify it. It's, it's all written, I placed a reference here, but just explaining a bit more in detail. So you can see here, so this is basically how much, you know, uh, the parameter which exceeds how much it's exceeded. So there is a certain formula. This is the value 0 0.058, which is the exact value and 0 0.05 is the guideline value. So you, you normalize it, you can create some score, which is, you know, uh, okay, yeah, which is something this, like this, 0 uh, uh, 1.6, 1.16, 1.35, 0 0.275. These four values basically came from these all parameters. I'm just gonna go back to the previous slide just to give you guys a heads up. So these four parameters are the ones which exceeded, which I mentioned, like this one, uh, 0 0.058, uh, 0 0.108, 0 0.0094, and 0 0.0051, those four parameters which exceeded the guideline. We calculated these, you know, exclusions for all these four, combine it, and calculate F3. I mean, there's a formula. And you can see on the bottom, if we combine F1, F2, F3, you get a certain score value, which is 88. Now, according to this uh, method, 88 means the water quality is good. And obviously it should be good because you can see on the parameter only out of one or three, only four times, only two parameters failed the test. In the rest of the time, the water quality was good. So you cannot actually see only those parameters, but you cannot only ignore them. So this is how you know, these methods were developed. And this is how these methods you know, facilitated 
in understanding the overall water quality. So you can now see this whole table, which is so complicated, like I'm not saying that for all of you, but you know, if someone reads this table with, with no background about water, they'll get confused. But if you just try, if you just present everything in just one number, which is on the 88, so you know, everyone can understand, okay, that's okay, the water quality is good or water quality is bad. So that's how you know you you manage it. Now, so this approach is very common. People have applied it, I mean, and still apply it. But this approach just merely gives everything on a number scale. This, those numbers sometimes doesn't mean anything. You know, water quality is, is CWK score is 88. What does this, how, you know, you're gonna be using those scores uh, to further, you know, improve the water quality. So that's why more, with more development, the concept of footprint came into being. Now, before going into the jumping into the concept, I'm just trying to, you know, give an idea, what is water footprint? You know, everything uh, that we, you know, use or everything that we consume for our betterment has an impact. You know, even if you apply a water treatment, it comes with the price of some impacts. It can have a, you know, impact. It can consume energy. It has some, you know, impacts with respect to chemicals or anything. So based on this, now globally, people are trying to quantify the impact of every activity to do, and they are trying to quantify on the scale of footprint. You know, we have green water footprint, we have environmental footprint, we have carbon footprint. I'm sure most of you have heard these concepts, but what is this concept is? It's all about, you know, anything you make, anything you produce, you know, you, there, is, there is something that is making up, so it has an impact on the environment and that's footprint. So people, you know, the water or basically I, I was about to say it's a footprint community is trying to map all of these concepts into one scale. Let's say if you have a municipality or if you have a city, the cars might have a footprint. It can have a you know carbon footprint, energy footprint, or water footprint. Similarly, you know, a house has a footprint, or you know, even water treatment has a footprint. So when you know whole globe is going towards this concept. We, as water engineers and environmental engineers, need to see this concept and try to map our impacts, you know, water quality challenges or pollution challenges on a scale of footprint. And for that, we need to understand what this virtual water is. You know, how we understand the poor footprint is, you know, every product that has been produced, you know, contains a virtual water, you know, that produced in the back and in indirect way, water might have used in, you know, during its processing, during its consumption. So if water has been used and come back to the system, like, you know, that's like a water cycle, that's okay. But what in the, most of us do is when we do the production, that water gets contaminated or it gets polluted and it doesn't get back to the system. And that's basically the water footprint is all about. So going into more detail, we have categorized water footprint into three categories, you know, blue water, green water, gray water. It's not something we call a physical concept. It is basically yeah, most likely it is it is a conceptual approach but in conceptual or in virtual way you try to quantify which has a more impact and which has a less effect and honestly that help that help a lot of the people in communicating their impact so blue water is all about you know water consumed from the surface water but water that is consumed and that didn't come back to the surface water back similarly green water is related to the rain and the most important is the gray water footprint which is basically is based on the concept of dilution that if, let's say, conceptually, if water is more, con more contaminated, means you need more fresh water to dilute it, not actually, but as conceptually. So that means if you say that system has a high gray water footprint, means the water that is coming, or the, you know, the polluted water that is, you know, produce, that system is producing is either very highly contaminated or is has a very much high load. So it's a simple concept, just like you are trying to pitch it in a different way. And, and that is all about, you know, the gray water uh, footprint. So simplifying it, these are the three uh, concepts, rainwater, uh, green water, blue water, and the fresh water. Uh, can you please all mute uh, uh, your speaker, please? Uh, it's all good. Thank you. Yeah. So there are three concepts, green, blue, and gray. 
what we'll be focusing is on the gray water footprint, but I'm just giving you a background, like what, what how we use these concepts for the betterment of our society. So this is just an example, you know, I kind of quoted. So you can see making a pizza. So making a pizza, you know, we have to make, to make a pizza, we need different ingredients. And for all these ingredients, somehow there, there, there needs to be a water, you know, water from the surface sources, water from the lake. And while producing it, there's also some, you know, waste that is generated. It's a basic concept, but, you know, you try to map it on a footprint scale. So even the making a pizza has some footprint. It, can, it has a footprint in terms of blue water, green water, because a certain amount of water has been used and that water doesn't go back to the system. So even the impact is minimum, but just making a pizza and now you, you can you know, quantify it on a scale, like how much water footprint of the pizza making is. It can be any number. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that there's no, there needs to be no footprint. You know, there is a footprint, but we need to see how much impact on water resources we are putting in this concept. And similarly, if the making a pizza has, you know, there are some chemical use to produce flour or, you know, to produce mozzarella or to, to produce something. So the more contamination, the more gray water is. So first to the blue and the green water, as you can see on the top, are the, are the per, you know, consumptive water use and the gray water is all about a degraded water use. So based on this concept, you know, all around the world, people have now tried to quantify it. And this is a very interesting research topic most of them because people are trying to quantify the impact of each activity, which includes from making a coffee, tea, soda, water, you know, beef, how much impact it has on the environment. And that's very important. I mean, this is a very simple concept, but you know, understand it is very difficult. On the other side, you know, for us, we say, okay, make, you know, making a soda has an impact. Now with a scale of footprint, you can actually quantify it. Now you can see on the picture, I'm sure most of you understand which, has, which, which product has, is having a more impact, which is having a less impact. That's how easy the communication can be. Otherwise, if someone starts, okay, how much is the impact of producing beef? You know, it's, it's, they're gonna you know, start making you know, discussion and maybe it can confuse anyone. So it's all about the communication and quantifying on the common scale. And based on this concept, you know, I, you know, move towards this concept of gray water footprint in drinking water quality management. So on the left side, you can see a dilution concept. I think most of you have, you know, done this series dilution in environmental microbiology. So this is the dilution means, you know, you dilute the contamination to a certain point where the contamination is no more. So you can see in the first coliform colony, there are, there, you know, the ratio is very high. In the last one, the ratio is very high. That's so. What I did now, coming up to my topic and you know, briefly giving you a discussion, I tried to quantify the water pollution in drinking water, uh, you know, drinking water system on the scale of gray water footprint, which has never been done before. And interestingly, you know, when as a water engineer, an environmental engineer, we when we go to some you know management or some decision makers or some politicians, we say, okay, this is high, this is low, we need a treatment plan. That's one thing. But in order to communicate to them, like what, how much this activity, this treatment plant or this treatment unit is gonna impact the environment. And you can easily compare, you know, give them the numbers on the scale of water footprint. Like this uh, treatment has high water footprint. This contamination has low water footprint. Trust me, that will help most of the people because they will see their footprint, their activity footprint, they can correlate like which activity is sustainable or which activity is necessary. So gray water footprint, which I use is based on the concept that the pollution, any contamination that can be arsenic, you know, iron, you know, disinfection byproduct comes on the top of natural water body. And it is just based on a simple ratio, which, you know, I dwell this gray water footprint equals V in, into C1 over CA, where V is the volume of water that is produced from a system. C is the contaminant, any contaminant or a group of contaminant exposure. I took the median value. CA is the acceptable exposure. So this equations merely look very simple, but there is a huge calculation on the back end. So basically what we are proposing is volume. Any system can have a high volume, low volume. So that, that can be applied on any system. So volume of water if the distribution system is higher. 
V value will be higher. Distribution system is less, uh, has a less population, V value will be lower. Similarly, for C1 and CA, the concentration that you are considering, you can consider like a bunch of 100 parameters or you can consider five parameters. You can consider their higher value or medium value. That's up to you. But overall, you are trying to map the ratio, that simple dilution on a scale of gray water footprint. So basically, you are considering the volume, the quantity, and the quality. And if you try to link with the distribution system you know, goals, we need to provide the water with good quality and quantity. And that's what how we are trying to use simple concept to present our you know, idea or to present our case. So these are the uh, key steps uh, that I adopted. And I haven't, uh, I'm not presenting the details about this because obviously if anyone is interested, you can read the paper. But overall, it's all about you know, ma mapping it. And most of you can even use this concept in your researches, in your, you know, in your, you know, in, in a consultancy report, wherever it's applicable. Because so I identified the different strategies. Strategy means water treatment systems uh, that are being currently applied in Canadian municipalities, you know, and identified what are the contamination concern. So I assessed their whole thing using this water footprint approach. I got the results and validate. Validate means, you know, compare the results with the established approach that is the Canadian Water Quality Index, which I just explained. That has been established 20 years back and it's very applicable globally. So I compared my approach results with the results that most of the municipalities are doing to present their, you know, water quality and try to estimate how much impact even water treatment facility is causing to the environment how much impact if we say one contaminant is very less, but we think it is less. But when we try to quantify it, we say, okay, what gray water footprint it does have. And it happens in when we do the assessment. So again, dating back to my concept, it's very important to quantify it. You know, treatment is one aspect and that's very important. I, I agree. Like when we, we are growing and we say, okay, we have, we have to develop a treatment system that's gonna change